Notice in verse 1, let us, therefore, we, have heard, we who have heard the gospel, let us, therefore, fear, lest a promise being left, and when he says that, you'll notice the us is in italics, the promise still is left. It's still here. That's the point. The promise still is here. It has not left us. And what we're called upon is to fear falling short. I hope every one of us this morning will listen to this and think about this. I fear falling short. Feeling fear falling short of what? I fear falling short of entering into his rest. Now that's the point. I think of what Paul said to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He said, I fear lest by any means as Satan tempted Eve through his subtlety through his deceptions, so your minds will be corrupted from the simplicity, the singleness, the onlyness of Christ. Now, the simplicity of Christ and resting in Christ is the same thing. And I fear not really resting. I hope this morning you fear not resting and I hope we'll learn what it means to rest in the Lord Jesus Christ now what a blessed thing this is that the rest is still here that the gospel is still here that it's still today <clears throat> the gospel still stands now listen real carefully Right now, the Lord says, by his Spirit, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Laboring and burdened under a sense of sin. He says, come unto me, not go and do, not go and get things straightened up. Come unto me, and I will give you rest. What a promise. Revelation twenty two seventeen says, In the Spirit and the Bride. This is what God the Holy Spirit says. This is what the Bride, the church, has to say. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Not go and do. Not Get things straightened out first. Right now, come as you are right now to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not go and do. Come right now to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him that is a thirst come. Let him that heareth say come. Whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Are you willing to be saved by Christ? Take him. Whosoever, are you one of those right now? Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are you whosoever? This is to you. Call upon the name of the Lord. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. I'd like you to 
<coughs> Turn with me to Romans 10 for just a moment. The gospel still stands. This is true today, just as it was when Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 10, verse 6. But, not, but the righteousness which is of faith, that's better than any righteousness you can produce. This is the righteousness of faith. The righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, say not in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven? Don't say in your heart, what can I do that will get up to heaven that he'll hear? Get that out of your heart. That is to bring Christ down from above. What can I do? Now here's what this exactly what this means. What can I do to get him to come down here and do something for me? Get that out of your thinking. Get that out of your language. Don't say that in your heart. Verse 7, or... Who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. Don't say in your heart, what can I do to make his death work for me? Get doing out of your thinking is what he's saying. Verse 8, but what saith it? The word is nigh thee. Right now, the word of the gospel is nigh thee. Even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Do you confess he's Lord? He's Lord of creation. He's Lord of providence. He's Lord of salvation. Do you confess that? And thou shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Do you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? Because he accomplished what it was he set out to do. And he was raised from the dead. What's it say? If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Thou. Thou, you, shalt be saved with God's salvation. Turn with me for a moment to Isaiah 55. The gospel still stands right now, today. The gospel still stands. Chapter 55, verse 1, Ho! Everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. Now who's told to come? He that hath no money. You don't have anything to bring to the table. You don't have anything to recommend you to God. He that hath no money, come ye buy and eat, yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which satisfies not? You know, the only thing that's going to satisfy you is the resurrection of Christ. The only thing that satisfies my conscience, the only thing I'm satisfied with is the resurrection of Christ. Why would you spend your money on anything but that? And your labor for that which satisfies? Hearken diligent unto me and eat ye that which is good and let your soul delight itself in fatness, incline your ear and come unto me. Here and your soul shall live. And I'll make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Now, do you see how the gospel still stands? It's so very near. The promise still stands. I love that hymn we sing. Come, ye weak and heavy laden bruised and mangled by the fall. If you tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. Not the righteous, <coughs> not the righteous, sinners, Jesus came to call. 
Let not conscience make you linger, nor fitness fondly dream. The only fitness he requireth is to have a need of him. Whoops. <coughs> Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Are you a sinner? <clears throat> he came to save you. The promise is still here. The gospel <clears throat> is still here. Now, <coughs> notice he says, back in our text in Hebrews chapter 4, <coughs> there's a promise that's left, but he says, let us fear lest a promise being left of us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it, lest you fail to enter into his rest, lest you fail to rest in Christ. Verse 2, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but... The word preached did not profit them. They received no saving benefit from the word that was preached. It didn't do them any good. The word was preached, but they didn't benefit from it. How come? Not being mixed with faith in them that heard. Now, when he says, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, He's talking about the children of Israel. They heard the gospel. They heard the gospel preached in the Passover. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. In the great day of atonement, the serpent lifted up on a pole. Look and live. The gospel was preached in the garden right after the fall to our parents. The seed of woman shall bruise and crush the serpent's head. Now, he didn't talk about what Christ would do if, or he'll offer you this or offer you that. I'm talking about what Christ has done. The seed of woman shall crush the serpent's head. And they saw that lamb that was slain to cover their nakedness. They were watching. The fig leaves, the covering that they made representing their own self-righteousness, which is the biggest contradiction of terms, the biggest oxymoron there is. Self-righteousness, it's filthy rags, but their self-righteousness was removed and they were covered by the Lord himself with that covering. How clearly the gospel was preached unto them. I think of the tabernacle, how clear the gospel's preached. How did you get into the Holy of Holies? What's the first piece of furniture? The brazen altar for the sacrifice. And in order to get into the holy place, there was next a laver of water, filled with water. Now, I think it's sad that people try to separate the sacrifice. Well, first you need to have the blood uh, shed for you, and that makes you justified. And then you need to clean yourself up in the water. No, the cleansing comes from the blood. That's what that water represents. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us continually from all sin. And you get in there, you have the lampstand, Christ our light. He's the light as to how I can be saved. The altar of incense, Christ's intercession for me. The table of showbread, Christ our food. We have the Ark of the Covenant with the uh, mercy seat over it. Oh, they heard the gospel so clearly in all of these uh, types and pictures. They, the gospel, they heard the gospel preached just as clearly as you and I have. But it didn't profit them not being mixed with faith. Now, what is it to have faith? Verse 3, 
4. We which have believed. Now here's what somebody does who believes. This is what I'll do if I believe. This is what you'll do if you believe. For we which have believed do enter into rest. Now, the gospel was preached to them. We've heard the gospel. And before I go on with what it is to rest in Christ, I want to ask this question. Have I heard the gospel? Is what you're hearing right now the gospel? You know, Paul warned of another gospel, didn't he? Is what I'm hearing, is what I'm preaching the gospel? What a question. Somebody says, well, if I haven't heard the gospel, it's your fault. You're the one doing the preaching. Well, you're right about that. <laughs> uh, I love what Paul said, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Have I heard when I hear this man standing before me preaching, have I heard the gospel? Turn with me to Romans 1, and we're going to get back to Hebrews 3 about entering into his rest, but turn with me to Romans 1. They heard the gospel. The gospel was preached unto them as well as unto us. Well, have I heard the gospel? Have I heard the gospel preached? Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Now, the gospel, I, almost, I, I, I hate saying it this way, the gospel of Todd, boy, that's not a good gospel, is it? The gospel of the Baptists or the Catholics or the Presbyterians. Uh, the gospel of the Reformers. I'm not interested in any of that. I'm interested in the gospel of God. Now what is the gospel of God? It's the gospel, verse 2, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. It's the gospel of the Bible. It's the gospel of the Holy Spirit. Scriptures. Don't you love that? The Holy Scriptures. Oh, this book is a holy book. This is the Holy Bible inspired by God. The gospel is the gospel of God that he has revealed in the Holy Scriptures. What is the gospel? It's the gospel, verse 3, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Well, who's he? He's the one who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power. He's the Son of God. He's made of the seed of David, the man Christ Jesus, according to the flesh. And he's declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now, how do we know he's the God-man? Well, he's the only holy man to ever live, and he was raised from the dead. That is the gospel of God. Now, I want to ask a few questions real briefly, because remember, we're asking, have I heard the gospel? Have I heard the gospel? Number one, is my gospel the gospel of God? Number two, does my gospel line up with the Old Testament scriptures? If it doesn't, it's not the gospel. You remember how Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, when he declared the gospel, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. It's how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. If my gospel doesn't line up with the Old Testament, it's not the gospel of God. God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Is that your gospel? Does it line up with the Old Testament 
scriptures. Thirdly, does my gospel give God all the glory in salvation? If man gets any glory, if man gets any credit at all, it's not the gospel of God. Does my gospel give God all the glory? Fourth, does my gospel give preeminence to Jesus Christ in all things? Is Christ all in all things in my gospel? Is he all in the scriptures? Is he is all God is? Is he all in my salvation? If my gospel doesn't give the preeminence to Jesus Christ the Lord, the blessed Son of God in all things, it's not the gospel. Fifth, does my gospel, listen real carefully, does my gospel violate any of the attributes of God? If it does, it's not the gospel. Now let me give you one very simple illustration of what I'm talking about. God is absolutely just. Amen? He's just. Always just. All the time. Now, if Christ could pay for my sins and satisfy the justice of God, and yet I end up in hell anyway because of something I didn't do, God would be unjust. That gospel, the gospel that would allow Christ to die for somebody, and yet they end up in hell anyway, is a violation of the justice of God. If Christ died for me, the very justice of God demands my salvation. Now, if my gospel violates any attribute of God, I don't care what it is, if it violates the sovereignty of God, if it violates the love of God, if it violates the immutability of God, it's not the gospel. Six, does my gospel honor God's holy law? Does my gospel reward for obedience to the law? Does my gospel punish for disobedience? Does my gospel actually honor God's holy law? Yes, it does. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Do we make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. The only way I can honor God's law is by believing the gospel. That's it. You know, the only way you're going to love God's law and delight in God's law is if you see it's fulfilled in Christ. All the threatenings and punishment are fulfilled in Christ. All the rewards for obedience are fulfilled in Christ. My gospel honors in every way, fulfills every jot and tittle of the law of God. Does my gospel meet a sinner where he is? Dead in sins and save him. Does my gospel meet me where I am? Unable, dead. Is it like the good Samaritan who came to the man where he was? Does my gospel <coughs> meet me where I am? Not where I should be, but does he come to me where I am and have mercy on me? If it doesn't, it won't do me, me any good. Will my gospel save the chief of sinners? If it won't, it's not the gospel. Will my gospel keep me saved? If it won't, it's no gospel. Now unto him that's able to keep you from falling 
and to present you faultless. Can I face death and judgment with my gospel? Listen, the time's coming pretty soon. All, all of us are going to stand for God and judgment. Will the gospel you believe enable you to face God, the holy God of glory in judgment, and be accepted? I think of that scripture in 1 John 4, 17, by this can we have boldness on the day of judgment. Now think of that concept. Boldness on the day of judgment, standing before a thrice holy God. Boldness? Because as he is, so are we in this world. Here's another way to say all this. Can, does my gospel provide everything that God requires? Is my gospel able to make me perfect, perfectly conformed to the image of of Jesus Christ so that I will stand and spend eternity perfectly conformed to the image of Christ just like him. Now, that's the gospel, isn't it? That is the gospel. Now, they heard the gospel preached just like we did, do, but the word preached, they heard that in all these Old Testament types, but it didn't profit them for this reason. It wasn't mixed with faith in them that heard it. Now, you and I will not believe, be saved apart from believing the gospel. Now, what is this thing of believing the gospel? He tells us in verse 3, back to Hebrews chapter 4. Verse 2, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard. For we which have believed do enter into rest. Rest. Now that rest is the rest of the Sabbath. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As I said, as he said, I've sworn in my wrath, they shall, if they or they shall not enter my rest. Uh, verse 19 of chapter 3, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. I've sworn in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Now, I love this verse. As a matter of fact, Lord willing, next um, Sunday, Lord willing, I'm going to preach a whole message on this statement. Although all the works were finished from the foundation of the world. That's how much we can rest. All the works are finished. And they were from the foundation of the world. Uh, you don't even, you don't even have to, See how well you're resting. It's done. It's done. I, I remember hearing, uh, well, I'm, I'm going, I don't want to chase a rabbit. Turn with me for a moment to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. Now remember, they which have believed do enter into rest. Verse 31, this is where this uh, concept comes from, this thing of resting in Christ. Genesis 30, or 1, verse 31, and God saw everything that he'd made. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus, the heavens and the earth were, what? Finished. What did the Lord say from the cross before he died? 
it is finished. Now, if it's finished, you know what? That means there's nothing for me to do. It's already done. Christ finished the work. John chapter 17, verse 4, he says, I've glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work thou gavest me to do. Why did he come here? To save his people from their sins. Matthew 1, 21 says, I shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And when he said it is finished, they were saved from their sins. So much so that this this work was finished before the foundation of the world. You can't possibly mess this up because it was already finished before you were even born. Nothing you can do in time can mess it up. Finished. And what are we to do? Rest. Rest in his finished work. It is Finished. On the seventh day, God ended his, uh, ver, thus verse 1 of chapter 2, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God, what? Ended his work. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. Now, we know that God didn't rest because he was tired. He rested because the work was finished. There wasn't anything left to do. We which have believed do enter into rest the rest of a finished, completed work. That we don't have any hand in this, so much so that it was done before the foundation of the world. So you obviously couldn't have done anything to make it happen because it was finished, completed. Now let's go on reading. For he spake, verse 4, for he spake, he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise and God did rest the seventh day from all of his works. The writer of the Hebrews is quoting what we just read. He spake, God spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, talking about uh, Psalm 95, if they shall enter or they shall not enter into my rest. It says if they shall, the meaning is they shall not enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. Why must some enter therein? Because God purposed it. Because God decreed it. Because God elected the people. Christ died for them. And God the Holy Spirit gives them life. And they must enter in. They must enter in. Seeing therefore, um, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein. And they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief. Again, he limits a certain day. Don't hide in yesterday's experience. Don't hide in what you intend to do tomorrow to make things better. Those are false refuges. Aren't you thankful that he limited it to today? Today, if you will hear his voice, the voice of the gospel, Again, he limits a certain day, verse 7, saying in David, Psalm 95, Today, after so long a time, as it said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Now that frightens me. Becoming gospel hardened so that I do not hear What's being said? Don't harden your hearts. 
I know if man's heart hardened, God hardened it, and I know this, it's hardened because he hardened his own heart. Both of those things are true. And I fear a hard heart because I know something about it, a heart that doesn't really hear what God is saying. He said, Today, if you will hear his voice, the voice of the gospel, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, and that's all about Joshua bringing them into the promised land where they were supposed to enter into rest, but they didn't. They didn't. For if Joshua had given them rest, then would he not afterwards have spoken of another day. Now there remaineth, therefore, a Sabbath keeping. That's the word. A Sabbath keeping. That's the only time this word is used in the New Testament. Now when we're talking about Sabbath keeping, understand. This is not talking about, well, on Sunday we don't cook, we don't, uh, we don't let the kids play, we just sit and, uh, and be sober and, and think about. Uh, for one thing, Sabbath on Saturday, it's not on Sunday. Someone talks about the, well, this is the Christian Sabbath. No, it's not. Uh, it's the Lord's Day. I love the Lord's Day, but Sabbath still is on Saturday. And the command of the Sabbath was to not work at all. And as a matter of fact, they found some people gathering sticks to make a fire. And some people saw them, and they ratted on them. They said, what are we going to do with these people, Moses? And Moses said, stone them. Now, if I don't keep the Sabbath, I'm going to be stoned. And so keeping the Sabbath is not keeping a day. So many people make a work out of not working. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about resting in Christ. And here's what that is. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest. How did God rest? Because the work was finished. That's why. It couldn't be improved. He looked at what he did and behold it was very good. And God sees things as they are. You and I don't. He does. He looked at what he did and it was very good. For he that's entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Now, you know when you rest in Christ? When you cease from your own works and rest completely in what he did. When he said, it is finished, there's nothing for me to do. I rest. Rest. Not work, not do, rest in what he has done. Now, the only way you're going to glorify God, the only way you're going to exalt God, the only way you're going to give honor to God is by resting in the Lord Jesus Christ. He that's entered into his rest, he also has ceased. From his own works as God did from his. You see Christ's work is all you want. That's all you want. You want to simply be found in him. Verse 11. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. Now why does he say that? That almost uh, sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? Let's labor to rest. Labor to enter into that rest. Now the reason he says this is because he knows the hardest thing. The hardest thing that you and I are called on to do is nothing. And we're all so naturally self-righteous that we just have a hard time with this thing of rest. He said, labor, make it your effort, strive to rest in Christ. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, <coughs> lest any man fall after the same <coughs> example of unbelief, like those Old Testament people who heard the gospel, but they didn't believe. 
and they never entered into that rest. <coughs> do you know what you do when you enter into his rest? You rest. Resting. Do not disturb. Let's pray. Lord, we ask in Christ's name that every one of us, by your grace, will enter into your rest. Lord, for Christ's sake, enable each one of us to cease from our own works just as you ceased from your works in creation because what you did was very good and you were finished. Enable us to rest in him who finished the work. Lord, don't let us come short of entering into his rest. Bless this word for Christ's sake. In his name we pray.